Good morning, everybody. How are you? We uh, are going to go ahead and get started. I think um, some more folks will be trickling in um, after um, uh, now that Mr. Davidson has uh, concluded his remarks. Um, but thank you all for being here today. My name is Saul Hernandez, uh, and pardon, and and I'm I'm excited to be here at the State of the Net conference with all of you, um, and with uh, most importantly our three incredible panelists who are working every day to advance digital equity and broadband adoption in communities across the country. Uh, as you know, in addition to funding provided by Congress, they gave us the Emergency Broadband Benefit Program and the Emergency Connectivity Program. Last year, Congress passed the Infrastructure Act that prioritized digital equity in the BEAD program and provided $2.75 billion for Digital Equity Act programs. It also provided an additional $14.2 billion for the Affordable Connectivity Program. This funding is now being deployed and it's critical we get it right to ensure that every dollar delivers the greatest impact possible. The rubber now is meeting the road and that's why today's discussion is so important. Our panelists today represent critical stakeholders who are already making digital equity and increased broadband adoption a reality. They're stakeholders who, uh, their stakeholders represent a leading skills training advocacy organization a nationally recognized telecommunications expert with decades of public and private sector experience, and the leader of the nation's first ever state office of digital equity. So please join me, if you would, in uh, welcoming Kate Spiker, who is the Managing Director of Government Affairs at the National Skills Coalition, Deborah Lathan, the President of Lathan Consulting, and Annette Taylor, uh, who serves as the Director of Digital Equity and Literacy at the North Carolina Department of Information Technology. So huge thanks for our panelists being here today and for our audience being here today. And because time is short, uh, if we can get right into it, and would just love to sort of ask a uh, table setting question to all of our panelists. Uh, and that is, uh, how do you define digital equity? Uh, and why is achieving digital equity in communities across the country so important? I've been nominated to look at it. Okay. But then push. There you go. Um, I, I define digital equity as being different from equality. And equity means serving the, the specific needs of the community of the individual. You know, we don't all start off on equal ground. And so it is being able to, it's specified, it's, local, it's localized. It's more than just being equal. You know, for example, you everybody probably has the right to go to public school, but we know in public schools, everybody does not get an equal education. There are inequities. So that's my, my, my definition of equity. Sure. So I appreciate that you started in part with what it's not, because I'm going to do the same thing. Um, so to I think digital equity requires someone to be able to access broadband, to be able to access devices and to be able to access the skills that enables them to use those devices. Um, and on top of that, I'd add that given the amount of need within the workforce for people to have digital skills, that we can break digital skills down into thinking about someone's ability to use devices at a basic level, um, the, and then the industry specific need that they'll need for some of those digital skills that go beyond someone d doing something just on a smartphone. Exactly. Yeah. So there we go. Okay, so thanks to my colleagues for uh, setting the stage there. Um, I think we all know the definition of what I think NTIA or what is defined as vision inclusion and people having the right resources and tools that they need that meets them where they are to be able to participate fully in a demo in the society um, and be full participants in this digital economy. And I just want to say what North Carolina sees achieving that as. Um, we want our households to have 80% subscription in our effort to close the digital divide. That is part of our goal. And we want our racial uh, minorities to achieve it at 80%. Right now, black households are at 64%. Um, Native Americans, 57%. And you know we have a large population. We have eight tribal communities in North Carolina. Um, there's a lot of uh, fear there among our Hispanic population who are at 68%. So we're trying to get across all racial subgroups 80% 
And of course, we want all of our households that have students in K through 12 to be at 100%. And so we believe that we'll be very close to achieving uh, digital equity if we reach some of those goals. So a follow-up on that, Annette, and a question for, for both you and, and for Deborah and Katie, please jump in uh, as well. Uh, De Deborah's Handbook, uh, which by the way is available in print uh, by this store and also on, you can scan these QR codes that are on all of the chairs. Um, uh, if you would like, it's an excellent, excellent handbook. I um, encourage you all to read it. Uh, but, but the handbook that, that Deborah uh, recently released highlights the fact that, broad, that the broadband adap uh, adoption gap is far greater than the broadband avail availability gap. So according to the FCC, 90% of U.S. homes have access to broadband at 25.3 or faster, yet only 77% of households subscribe to home broadband. And so, uh, Deborah, your research found similar numbers. Uh, why is it uh, that you think that some folks who have access to broadband have not yet adopted the service? And what do you think the root cause of, of that delta is? Well, I think, Michael, um, I, I, I think that, you know, we can't, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. We talk about digital divides, we talk about skill divides. But before that, there was the Rift Valley of a divide of people who have not been a part of this society and do not trust government. Okay. So I think the adoption issue boils down to income. We see there are lower income people who do not subscribe. It boils down, and they tend to be people of color. They tend to be tribal people who have not adopted broadband. And it also boils down to whether or not they, people consider it to be relevant and so right now, you know, when I say, so the digital divide, the, sk schedule, sk the skills divide, they just dumped more into a deep, deep rift that was already there. And we use terms like socioeconomic issues need to be determined. And we, but what does that really mean? That means that, you know, they just, they just uh, stopped giving me uh, the amount of money that I was supposed to get for SNAP. I used to get $300 a month. Now I get $90 a month. Okay. It means that I don't have access to de de decent health care. All of those things are going to impact whether or not people adopt. Yeah. And so it's more than just socioeconomic. It is, can I feed my teenagers on $91 a month? So we have to start thinking about this in really real terms. And then I think you go to adopt and you can tell people, how this is going to help you with these issues that are that, that impact your life in, in, a, in a negative way. And the last thing I'll say, because I'm not the only person on this panel, is trust. Okay, we say trust, but what does that mean to people who have already been sitting in the middle of this huge gap? You know, we're cutting off food stamps now. Oh, wow. So we, the government doesn't care about me. You know, so you have to get past. And how do you get past that? You have to talk to people who've walked in the same shoes as the people who are trying to get to adopt. You have to have people who know the community who can navigate through it. So that's my rather long answer. Yeah. And Annette, let me really just speak to North Carolina being so rural. So availability, obviously, is the biggest challenge in some places, um, most places that are in rural areas. And of course, there's an underserved in some of the other areas. Of course, the cost is the factor is exactly what she's talking about. Um, but then there's the relevancy again. People, we're getting a little bit past that, but I think it's always going to be an issue. Uh, people actually thinking that it makes sense for them. You know, we have a lot of retirees in North Carolina. It's a great place to retire. Um, but there are a lot of people who are like, I don't need this. I mean, we know that our grandparents are just only, only have it most of the time because their grandkids are coming to visit. And if they don't have uh, Wi-Fi, then we don't, they don't want to be there. So um, I think that's part of what we're trying to address by determining what are the barriers, what make people feel safe. Of course, uh, that there's that safety issue, uh, cybersecurity, which is one of the reasons that I'm very happy and proud that our office is in our Department of Information Technology because we focus a lot on cybersecurity. And, and, and Kate, any any thoughts on on that on that question? Yes, please. I was second and thirding my fit. Um, you know, I think that it it. I can probably start jumping ahead to some of the other questions that you've got with it. It just makes me think of so many different pieces of the conversation. The first is that we're in D.C., and we know that a lot of the policy decisions that we've made for decades have created 
the wealth gap and the uh, inequality that we're seeing play out in some of the digital conversations. And it's reflected in where we see people's ability to access skills. It's uh, reflected in that division that I that I explained between the, the basic skills that people need in order to use a smartphone and then the ability to read software if they're on a construction site or to use augmented reality, not just to play a game, but to repair yeah. something in an aerospace engineering play, uh, center. And so we're, we're thinking about how we actually measure the impact of this across communities, both when someone can help their grandparents on the internet and then recognizing that that's not the full problem here. And we yeah. can adjust and get down to some of the more specific, um, you know, ways to address these inequalities and not just check the box and say that, you know, the, the beef funding is good. Yeah. All right. So we, affordability came up in each of your, in each of your answers and, and it, important to note that um, the uh, creation of the affordable connectivity program uh, provides a $30 uh, subsidy to qualifying um, households. And important to note that a lot of ISPs, Comcast, Charter Cox, among others, have created plans that cost $30 a month, um, essentially making the service free. Uh, and so do you think that, what, to, to, to that end, um, you know, what, what role does ACP play in, in one of the many ways that we can play? I'll answer that. Digital divide. I think it's critical. It's crucial. It's imperative. Both of the first adjectives I can come up with. <laughs> um, ACP, we've got to increase awareness. People, I mean, I know so many people, they never, they never heard of it. So you got to get the word out that it's there. That's imperative. And then the other thing is, you know, there are 48, let's say 48 million people that are eligible, but only 18 million have sold more. So that's the awareness part of it. But the other part of it is also that we have got to really push Congress to extend the ACP. Because if we don't, the consequences will be dire. And we can't let it lapse. You know, Congress takes its time. If it lapses, what happens during that period? It'll be, I told you, I don't trust government. They signed me up here. All they wanted was my information. Okay. So you can't let it lapse. Okay. And we need, if, and, and this, it's critical because this is, as Davidson said, this is a monumental time. This is the only time that we're going to get probably in our lifetimes to make this happen. So awareness and push Congress to really extend ACP. Yeah. It, go ahead. And start. I was, I was going to ask, I mean, to... Uh, Deborah and, and, and Annette, you're, you know, you are on the ground in all of North Carolina's 100 counties, um, and, and you all mentioned the the role of trusted community partners. Talk about how digital navigators um, and and folks, uh, you know, organizations within the communities, whether that's churches, the Boys and Girls Club, um, uh, you know, schools and libraries, et cetera. Uh, what what role do they play, and and how how are are you in North Carolina and your counterparts in other states working um, with those community partners to to Deborah's point to 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 um, increase visibility of the program? Yes, we're creating that awareness. She's right. Awareness is really key. Is and also just understanding it. Uh, we know in North Carolina that there are 1.1 million people who are actually eligible for it. Uh, we currently actually have 675,000 households that are on the Affordable Connectivity Program, but we have a goal to get at least 1 million on because we know everyone is not going to get on. There are always going to be people who just don't trust it, just don't want it, just don't understand how it makes sense to them. Um, but we're working with libraries, all of our uh, trusted partners. I mean, people know now that we are focusing on this. Uh, we've been out there. We've been in the news. They've been hearing things. So, you know, they're looking. They're like, how can we get involved? What do we need to do? Uh, people are a little nervous about it, but we are hiring digital navigators. We're actually going to have our own statewide digital navigation program in our office. We're using ARPA funds to invest in that. We're going to launch a major PR campaign because we have to partner and we have to support the work that ISPs are already doing, the ones who have these programs, the ones who are really making an effort. Uh, a lot, of, Look, a lot of, we, we get calls all the time. We have a toll-free number actually, but there's no one actually managing it and we're making a change. We're hiring. Is anyone interested in coming in? <laughs> oh, we're hiring. Um, but uh, yeah, we're really trying to create programs and we're also looking to establish a hotline with um, our NC211 system because they already have the infrastructure in place. And so that program would not just create awareness. They're going to have digital navigators who build that trust. They have to listen to people. And that's what I've been doing for the last nine months, people calling in. And you can't just get on the phone and say, okay, refer them to another number. They want to tell you their story. They want you to understand what's happened. 
I submitted my application. I don't have Wi-Fi, so I had to send it in by mail. What happened to it when it went in? Can you call them because they're not answering my call? There's a lot of different barriers and people give up on it. So we want to reduce that, eliminate that, mitigate that by putting people in place who care and people who actually want to help someone connect the dots. And are some of your digital navigators in, in North Carolina going to be regionally based in different parts of the state? Yeah. We would say in, in uh, as a well, North Carolinian, uh, as an adopted North Carolinian, we say from, <laughs> from Murphy to Manio. Um, and I imagine that you're going to have folks in all parts of the state who um, who have uh, who have deep relationships in these communities that they serve. Right. And that work is already taking place. We have an organization in um, Charlotte, which Charlotte is one of our largest, um, you know, municipalities in North Carolina. They have a Center for Digital Equity. They already have a digital navigation program. They're also working with Education Superhighway, which has been very helpful. And I think other states obviously have this same opportunity. Um, They have put the information out in the public schools. In the public schools that actually have, uh, I think, Title III, you know, students, uh, they're working really hard on targeting students um, in the university system that have Pell Grant, that get the Pell Grant. And I think it's working because we actually saw an uptick. Um, so that's in Charlotte, the Western area. Um, you know, there there's nonprofits in the uh, mountain areas. And then we have Eastern North Carolina, which is a really uh, huge rural area where there's a, a big concern there. And so we are working with churches all across the state, really. But there's a huge church presence that has huge associations and they're touching every single nonprofit. And so we're investing in those type of programs for digital navigators. And of course, the libraries. We have a huge library a partnership. I don't want to go too far into the questions, but I will say that we're using some of our ARPA funds to invest in grant funded programs so that the nonprofits can not just help us get the word out, but they can create their own digital navigation programs. And one of them is the public library system. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Katie, I, I wanted to talk about uh, your report that, that your organization recently released. So last month, the National Skills Coalition, uh, in partnership with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, released a report on closing the digital skills divide. Um, it, it too is um, uh, impressive and comprehensive uh, and provides several recommendations on how we all can collectively work toward delivering digital equity. So your report makes clear, uh, and we've been sort of talking about this uh, throughout the questions, that um, we can't close the digital skills divide by operating in silos. Uh, and so if you would um, uh, share with, with our audience um, your recommendations and the report's recommendations on the holistic approach um, that the coalition uh, uh, offered that involves government, private sector, and these trusted community partners that we've been talking about. Absolutely. Um, and I, before I start, I want to offer two caveats. So the first is, as I'm nodding in agreement with everything you're saying about how incredible the report is, our research team put it together. So I want to tell you all the stories as our uh, <laughs> government affairs side, but I'm going to have to read all the numbers that that the author, Amanda, and the folks from the Reserve Board uh, put together. So, um, And the other thing that I'll build on before I get started is your point about breaking down silos, which is really where National Skills Coalition sits. So we're based in, as the name suggests, a coalition of the folks at the ground level who are really involved in helping someone navigate the process of education after high school, of figuring out how to get and keep and progress within a job. And we also sit, because of that coalition function, at really a pragmatic spot where we try and identify what are the solutions that can work for businesses, particularly small and mid-sized companies who engage most with our public workforce system. Um, And then how can we, from that coalition, really break down across silos? So we're hitting the kind of policy solutions that a community college for um, oh, now I didn't write down the regions, but for the central part of the state can uh, can connect with the nonprofits who aren't funded through higher education funding in the eastern or western part of the state. And it's that breaking down silos that I hear and, and when you're describing about in North Carolina that we find so critical talking about whether how someone gets any kind of skills. The good thing is with digital skills, we've been able to dig in and get some really accurate real time numbers about what businesses are hiring for today. So my colleagues looked at 43 million job postings from last year, which is different from how we usually are able to evaluate the kind of skills needs that folks have, because we're usually looking at projections of labor market data, or we're looking at the past to say, here's what investments, for example, from the Recovery Act uh, 15 years ago had an impact on as we spent down that money. But the researchers with the Federal Reserve Bank and National Skills were able to drill down into those real-time job postings 
and found that 92% of jobs today require at least one digital skill. So that means that almost every job that someone's hiring for is going to need them to have education that they're, they're probably not getting in high school. And for our four communities, for communities of color, are most, much more less likely to be able to access through our post sec or excuse me, for our secondary system uh, at the public system. And so that means that people are, are walking into these trusted intermediaries looking for these digital skills. And it does really differ across states and across regions within states, whether we're talking about a community college, an industry association, a chamber, um, the nonprofits. And so what we like to think about is about that intermediary and how we're supporting the ability of that intermediary to engage with businesses who are hiring workers, as well as some of the folks that are going to help people succeed in that job training program and in that job. So it's about supporting the community college, for example, ensuring that they've got a digital navigator that's connecting to businesses in the area and identifying the critical skills. And then it's about ensuring that some of the human, human service providers are able to link up and, and help people get through that training program. So it's making sure that they have nutrition services through um, SNAP. It's making sure that they're able to continue to access healthcare services or continue to access a, um, a bus or transportation route that they need or child care that they may need throughout that program. And the exciting thing about this is this is how we look holistically at people who need jobs across the needs. And so we've got the information about what works in the digital space and for digital skills. It's just about drilling down to the fact that right now, um, again, those 92% of jobs over time, that could on average lead to a $23,000 increase in earnings per year mm -hmm. for people to go from that no digital skill level to having one, just one digital skill in those jobs. It, Deborah, you were, you were nodding. It, uh, it, it, any any thoughts on that on that question and and uh, Katie's organization's report? Sure, it's amazing. It's incredible. It it's really fantastic. And I guess I, I yes, my thoughts on that is we have to cover it all to global get it these skills. We have to follow, span everything together. But you know, it's in everybody's self interest to do this. It's not just for the underserved and the unserved. Because if ninety two percent of our jobs require that you have one digital skill. Yep. What does that mean for our economy? What does it mean for the, our GDP? What does it mean for us to be able to compete in the world on a large scale? Oh, I have this number. I tell you what Amanda Bergman chill talks, that's for the number. So it's not just upskilling those who don't have skills just because it's the right thing to do, which it is, but it's also we all need this. We need this for our our country to thrive and to continue to be in world play. Absolutely. Uh, well, the, the number, the first number that came to mind is that when we're talking about the tax base then for families, that means that when someone's going from a job that doesn't require any digital skills to one that requires just one, that's about anywhere from a two to $4,000 tax increase that that family will have, which means the community will then have those resources to support the public education and to support the nutrition services and additional things that help not just, to your point, the workers succeed, but businesses see that sustained growth. Yeah. Well, I just want to remind people of the folks who help with our supplier of our food systems, farm workers. We have a lot of farm workers in North Carolina, but it's not just about them working out there in the, in the farm, they have to learn to operate those digital systems now, the irrigation system, that's all technology. And of course, they have opportunities to move beyond what they start in. And we also have a large migrant, you know, workers and, and, and a lot of immigrants coming in. And I'm getting phone calls from folks saying, are there any grant funds available for us to get devices to move in households um, of people who just came in? So, you know, I'm navigating a lot of different type of partners and relationships because, I mean, our funds are not specifically for that in that way. We can't just give them out. We're not a corporation who might have discretionary funds. We have to have a process. But I do want to remind people that um, there's another population of folks who um, are contributing to our economy. Well, but the ACP does provide a minimal amount of uh, money for equipment. And then you do have some corporations and companies that are coming together to provide more support. So I think it's going to have to be going back to the private, you know, government partnership mm -hmm. because the businesses realize that they need people with digital skills. Right. Yeah. And the $100 is very uh, helpful, but a lot of people say, well, if the computer is 400, 
you know, I still need the other 300. Right. And then how's it going to get maintenance when I have an upgrade? So uh, sustainability is a, is a big factor in this whole um, process. It, well, and that leads me to my next question. And, and you all sort of alluded to this in the previous, um, your answer to the previous question. But, um, you know, working with net, networks of, of, um, of, you know, organizations within the coalition and, and just uh, writ large and in trying to um, deliver digital equity, uh, what what is uh, in, in addition to uh, private sector, you know, working to working to build out uh, these networks, taking advantage of the of the bead funds to to do that and to and to edge out into um, uh, either uh, underserved or unserved areas. Uh, what what is the what what do you see the role of the private the private sector in in increasing uh, not only a, adoption uh, of, of broadband, uh, but but uh, also, um, you know, in helping to close the digital divide, which obviously uh, adoption is a is a big part of that. I'll ask it. From a incentives a for workforce incentives for and folks to even understand what type of jobs are available. It's not just creating the awareness where they go into the community colleges. I mean, they could create uh, programs in the high school so they begin to understand. Because since we're in a workforce crisis, you got to get people younger. Uh, we are in a skills-based type of workforce where everyone doesn't have to go to a four-year university to get the type of skills they need for these jobs. So I think that the private sector could help there because it's going to help them uh, reach their goals. I mean, the ARPA funds that we use for with the great grants, we just distributed about $280 million in great grants um, to some providers in North Carolina. And uh, they need to try to do this deployment fairly quickly. But I think the workforce shortage is a problem there. So how do you get people to understand that, you know, can you take this class here at the community college? Um, and then I also rely on them for awareness of the ACP. So there's kind of a twofold um, in, in addition to what they're already doing around. And I'm just kind of speaking to those groups, but there are other corporations. Um, we have corporate funders who want to be in this space. Uh, there's a healthcare insurance company that's like, hey, we want to be involved everywhere we go around the state talking about the medical or the health crisis, um, how do we get involved in this broadband space? And so, because tele telemedicine is so important to them. It, Kate, any thoughts on that on that question? It, um, right, up, right up your alley. Yeah, well, just yes. Yes, what you're, um, I think it goes back to some of the strategies that we know work across how people find jobs when they find them and when it doesn't work in our public workforce system. We're seeing the same things kind of repeated right now without those intentional linkages between the companies that are hiring for digital skills, which going back to the report, right, that's all companies, 92% um, of them. But um, so that they're engaged in the ability for someone to gain those skills. They're engaged in that process. They're spending the time investing in making sure the curriculum at the community college is meeting their needs. And that's often, it's not so much just someone from a big corporation going in and having a conversation with a community college. It's bringing the other five, six businesses in the local area that might need someone with a certain kind of welding skill. And they also are going to need the digital skills in order to do the quality control there. And it's because the community college is really only able to run a course when they've got 10, 15 students in it, even on the non-credit side. Then we see multiple companies coming together to work together to figure out what that curriculum looks like. And from a small and mid-sized company, it could be the president showing up to have some of those conversations. And so we look at that kind of over time commitment that we need from industry to be part of the conversation. And we see a lot of small and mid-sized companies stepping up. Um, the cost of turnover for a smaller mid-sized company when someone's been with the company for less than a year is still $25,000. And so by helping someone gain the skills who works for the businesses, by engaging with partners who can help both new workers and the workers at that company upskill, that company can save some of that investment and maintain the continuity of having a worker who's been skilled up to their needs. And we have seen companies that are, you know, stepping up to the plate. And, you know, Comcast just, they're doing their UP program. And they've been doing digital literacy skills training for well over a decade now. And so it's important to connect with those organizations who have expertise uh, and money. <laughs> yeah. And... And I also add to that, thinking about the workforce nonprofits in the community, like the Goodwills, right. um, because you know uh, the the corporate sector. A lot of times, people just see them as business, and so for them to build that trust and that comfort for people to want to be a part of this process, 
they can connect with folks like Goodwills and Urban Leagues, and they're the ones who are helping to serve individuals like um, the incarcerated and reentry. Um, and so we must use that human capital as well. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, Deborah, a, a question about your handbook, who, that again, is available in the back of the room and on the QR code here. Um, it lays out best practices for state and local policymakers that I, I would imagine would trickle up to the federal level as well um, uh, to ensure that digital equity programs and uh, interventions are equitable by design. And so you make several recommendations on digital skills programming, right. digital navigators as, as critical components for helping uh, folks overcome uh, a range of barriers to adoption. But if you, if you would, can you um, uh, talk about some of those recommendations and best practices yeah, and, some, ha and how they're being put to, to, right. to use across the country? Okay, I won't go into detail about all of them as they are in, in the book, but it's critical to have data and to have good data and have good maps because you got to know where people are to build out the infrastructure and you have to know where they are to be able to to reach them to get them to adapt so that's that's critical and we say that it's got to be equitable by design and that's one of the critical components having the uh, the correct data and then you have to have measurable objectives you got to know you got to have somebody who you could hold accountable that you go to and to make certain that your plan is actually being instituted um, and we know that you got to make certain that the, it's affordable. That's the piece, the, the um, American ACP, and it's available. And digital literacy skilling is imperative. Um, and just the whole awareness is very, very uh, important. Those are all critical, critical things that, that we mentioned. And another thing that I would add that I thought about actually later was you know, enforcement is going to come. So we know that the states and localities will be held accountable for how all this money is being spent. And so there's a delicate balancing act that goes on to make sure that you have the information to support how the funds are being spent, but also to make such certain that they're not so onerous that people want to block. They're like, I don't want to turn over this information to you. And so that's a delicate balancing act that I think um, you have to do in, in your planning as well. And as I say, this is all... On page four of my head. <laughs> uh, but uh, Annette, and, and sort of to um, to to uh, Deborah's uh, answer, um, in in North Carolina, you're leading a team that's building and implementing the state digital equity program, and and again, the first in the in the nation to have uh, the position that that you hold. Uh, mm -hmm. What what uh, you know? What does that work look like that you and your team are undertaking in in the hundred counties across the state? And, uh, what are some of the opportunities and challenges that you're that you're facing? Um, thank you for that, Saul. I am very proud of North Carolina and uh, the the work that's been done and um, how our administration uh, led in this effort. Um, the challenge, okay, so we have an obligation um, to uh, get as many people as connected as possible, as fast as possible, um, and we have an opportunity. And the opportunity is meeting people where they are. And the challenge is meeting people where they are. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's a matter of again creating that awareness, but also creating the space for them to give input. And in our digital equity plan, that's exactly what we're going to do. Uh, we're involved, like every other state, in uh, the next. Now we're kind of at six months, so we feel kind of rushed, right? We want to get this right. Um, but we also have a digital equity plan that is due to NTIA. Um, in October, if anybody wants to extend that, um, <laughs> and we'll, we'll accept that. But uh, we're putting together a full community engagement plan with all the covered populations. Um, we're going to do that um, in a very strategic way. Of course, we have a very strong facilitation guide. We're working with uh, consultants uh, who are going to help us with that as well as writing the plan. And I think that it's important that you ask the right questions. Uh, we have a lot of listening sessions planned and now organizations are calling us as can they be part of our listening sessions not just part of them but can they facilitate one just for their population so those who know about us are kind of making it easy for us um, but we're also doing regional sessions so we can make sure that the anchor institutions are involved the local government coordination is there those state so it's not just about our state agencies being involved which they are a huge part of the solution because they're already serving these populations but we got local government who needs to be there. They're the ones who know a lot about what's going on with the infrastructure, but they also are serving those people at the local level. And so they know what the barriers are. 
Um, I was just actually talking to my sister-in-law yesterday. She's a director of social services in uh, Wilmington. And so she was saying, oh, we already sit down. We have a computer lab so that when people come in to apply for um, food stamps or even child support, um, we just tell them if you want to go over there and, and self-serve, you can do that. And we tell them all the programs because a lot of them feel uncomfortable with it, right? Um, and she says, but then they all have a barrier. I don't want to put my information out there. I don't know what you're collecting on me. Oh, I, I have this problem. Somebody might find this out. It's a lot of stuff, but they have people. She said, we'll sit right down with them and walk them through it and tell them what they have to put in and what they don't have to put in. And that's where the role of the digital navigator, but being in that type of place, I was really impressed to know that because I, I'm thinking more about libraries or even the community college. We know the library is that place in Every community, everyone is welcome, right? Not everyone's going to social service, but again, it's back to meeting them where they are. And so, with we, you, you mentioned, um, you know, put, putting together the the state digital equity plan, uh, digital equity plan that's due to NTIA in October. Yeah. Um, how how are you? How are you and your team um, uh, in North Carolina at the, the Department of Information Technology? Uh, how how are you? Um, not only engaging with with stakeholders on the ground in, in the hundred counties, um, but but how are you interacting with your federal partners at NTIA? Um, you know, the FPOs are going to be in in uh, federal program officers are going to be in every state, uh, and we're just just curious for for this group how how those conversations and how how um, how that whole this go. Yes, we meet with our federal program officer every week. <laughs> I think it's every week or every other week, but definitely they're available to us. They want to be supportive. We really appreciate that. Um, they're not pushy. Um, and so they're available to either come to any of our convenings or they will host one for us. And we like that. But not just that. We um, we may have questions. Like, we don't have this all figured out. Everybody's trying to understand it and figure it out. Um, and so when we have questions, they're available to answer questions. Uh, there's a lot going on with the, you know, risk management issues. Uh, we've just got to get this right. So uh, it's been very helpful to have a team. Uh, there is that regional director and even the regional um, director with uh, the federal program officers. Um, they uh, they kind of give that federal program officer, and I don't see Will, but he was here earlier, um, the autonomy to work with us and to answer our questions and then to come back because many of them are learning as well. So we're all learning together. So I think it's been a really great relationship that we're building. Um, they know our plan. Um, in North Carolina, uh, we kind of put together our own outreach plan and we made sure that we, you know, uh, crossed all the T's and dotted the I's so that when they came to us and said, hey, we want to help you do this, we like, we got it. This is what I was looked like, right? And it was like, oh, that, that actually was good. Like, So, you know, but we received their feedback. We, we want them to be right there at the table with us. Um, and so we feel like we have a really good, robust plan for how we're going to um, get um, uh, feedback. Uh, we're going to do surveys. We're actually creating our own website so that folks who did, we did not meet in person, they'll have a way to provide input. We already have a nice website, ncbroadband.gov. And uh, on that website, there are a lot of resources there, but we're going to beef that up because we want people to know how to get involved with us. But we have a webinar coming up tomorrow, so I'm going to have to get back soon. But in our webinar, uh, we're going to tell everyone about what the process. And so we have been pushing this out through press release and every single stakeholder that we already have information. And so we are uh, planning to make sure that as many people as possible that want to be involved can be involved. Uh, we'll create that plan, of course, as we draft that plan. Our goal is to have our plan drafted, I think, by um, August so that we'll have uh, the one month to give the public feedback to get it. Maybe it's by July. Because August is the month I think we need a public feedback. We need all of September to actually fix it, update it based on the guidance and advice. And then, of course, we'll need to get it to our governor because, you know, he's, you know, he's the man. He needs to see it. Um, and then we'll need to submit it in a timely manner. You know, we tried to um, go above and beyond. So we'll try to probably have hours in earlier, although I was asking for an extension. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> And and uh, Deborah and Katie, do do um, do you and your in your capacity, Deborah and Katie, uh, at at the National Skills Coalition, work with federal partners, NTIA, MCC, and 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 in in, in what in what capacity, and um, how do you find, you know, the the support and, and and conversations back and forth with them? We work with them in two capacities. So the first is more from the external affairs, government affairs side. 
We work a lot with helping our networks understand, so the community colleges, the public workforce practitioners, the businesses with whom we work, about what's happening and how they can hook into the work that the states are doing. Um, when we think about the first part of the conversation, we were talking about the workforce challenge that all this has. We have a whole silo within public services of a public workforce system that has resources. They're stretched, they're underinvested, they're probably not the place to tap to look for all the solutions for some of these challenges until Congress fixes the way that we invest in it. But, um, but they are a required partner in order to, be, to really see success in some of this because you can tap into the infrastructure, you can tra tap into some of the funding. And so it's about bringing together all those entities, and that's the place where we've been working with NTIA the, at the federal level. The other side is some of the technical assistance that my colleague who authored the report are working on across our policy team to work with states and dig into what are some of the barriers for connecting across the broadband office and the workforce and higher education systems within the state and helping them come together to have, and this is what, and that I was struck by everything that you were sharing is so pragmatic and practical and detailed in the steps. And that's really what, what we're trying to help make the connections from, bringing the other partners who are not the connection experts and not the digital experts together in order to build on that expertise that we see in Annette's office with the, the workforce capacity that we uh, know exists at the local and state level as well. If there, would you have any? No, okay. <laughs> um, any, uh, a follow-up to that question, sort of any, any advice, uh, and, and this is for, for each of you, you all uh, represent different constituencies and, and have different areas of expertise. Um, any, any sort of advice for, uh, for an NTIA or MCC with respect to um, the administering of these programs and, and as Deborah alluded to, this once-of-lifetime investment um, in, in, in not only uh, uh, increasing adoption, but but also, well, not not only increasing access, but also increasing adoption. For me, babe. Oh, I'm still thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just what I would say is, you know, I spent a lot of years in government, and I spent many many years in Washington D.C. And I, my advice to NTI, are diplomatically would be that I know it's the flip side of what I just said. I know that you have to be responsible that fraud, waste, and abuse does not occur. But do not overdo it and over-regulate this to the extent that is, it is a deterrent for people to, the people in states to participate um, in, in probably. That, that's one thing I think but that NTIA should, should be uh, cautious about. But on that note, I'd say, look, I'm super optimistic that NTIA is going to make this happen. He then just heard Davidson speak, and he's certainly excited about because this, this, this is our time. This is it. So, and they are the experts, but just don't, don't overdo it. Don't be too Washington. Don't be too bureaucratic. Stood. One. Katie, any thoughts on that? I, I think one of the successful things that we see happening with NTI right now is collaboration with other federal agencies and sub-agencies. And I think that's really critical. And they released guidance around um, some of the connections between workforce practitioners maybe six months ago that was informed really closely by some of the job quality plans that Departments of Commerce and Labor and Education have been working together on so that we're thinking about the digital skills that someone has access to being a pathway not just to a job, but to a good job that supports business growth and that individual's growth. And those connections and breaking down the silos, modeling at the federal to enable and support it happening in the way that we know it can and is at the state and local. You just add one, one more, Sam, um, because I do have great competence in NTIA. I actually did previously some review of applications that they've received, and I can't go into the details of it. But the, the review was thorough, it was compassionate, and they wanted people to be able to get the funds and to succeed. And that's, that's where they started. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll just touch on two points. Um, our state, just like others, completed the application for the digital equity planning funds. I'm very grateful that we received those. Um, their support and technical assistance was, uh, you know, I mean, second to none, we were very grateful, as some of them were figuring it out as well, as I said. Um, 
I think us understanding the role between them and NIST, um, and, and back to your point about partnerships, um, I would say just to continue improving that because it makes a difference for the states who are delivering these programs. Um, and same with FCC. I mean, we're still trying to understand the data. Obviously, everyone is. Um, but um, understanding and listening to us as the people who are at the state level deploying it um, or executing on this plan and trying to understand. I don't know if anybody else had noticed this in the states, but in your state, but the uh, enrollment in the Affordable Connectivity Program uh, looked like it was declining for us over a few months. And so since, you know, it's our goal to get it as high as possible, we were like, oh, what's going, what's going on here? Why is this going down? I think we're back down to maybe 630, 640. Did people just fall out? Did they not recertify? What's happening? We started understanding a bit more because we have so many different things going on. We can't just study every intricacy of it. Um, but as we try to understand it for ourselves and the way we want to guide and advise on policy and even encourage our own um you know, policymakers on how to, to help sustain it. We just want to understand all those things. And I think being a part of understanding that um, is really big for us. So I just continue, I just ask to continue empowering us as you're becoming empowered yourself. Very good. Uh, so we all share the the goal of universal connectivity and, and the, the, the purpose of, of all of this money uh, uh, at the, that's been made available at the federal level that's flowing to the states and localities uh, is to deliver that. And so we, we know what we, we started out defining digital equity. Um, but how is digital equity going to evolve once we, once we are able to get um, the vast majority, the 100% connectivity or as close to that as possible? And, and as a follow-up to that, uh, what do you think the next set of challenges will be that will encounter as, as we uh, bring more and more households online? You're looking at me like I should answer <laughs> first, because I'm... Well, look, this is what I... What you think? That's a very, very futuristic question, <laughs> because right now we're sort of at the basement level of this, and so we're just trying to make it up to the first floor. <laughs> So we can look out and have a better understanding of what the lay of the land is. I think, so it's, it's really hard to predict, you know, what the future looks like, but I know what we have to do today to get to that future. And there are the things that we discussed today. You got to get people signed up. And once we do all of these things, which I think we are absolutely capable of doing, once we do those things, then we also know that Technology is just not sleeping, you know, while we are marching forward to get people signed up. We have to know how we will continue to bring people to elevate better to meet the, the, the new de developments in technology. Yeah. So I guess I think we're still at, you know, at Tech 101 or Broadband 101 right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. There are always going to be some type of divide because there's going to be people who don't trust or we're going to have uh, new citizens who take a while to trust um, uh, our, our government systems. Um, and then there's going to be uh, not just the fear of their the, the privacy and all of that, um, but just the relevancy and the need. So there'll be some divide, but I think that we're moving the needle on that. Um, mm -hmm. But as it evolves, more people being online, there's more of a need for cybersecurity, obviously. Um, and then just protection of their data and how to do that, how to make people uh, feel comfortable with that and what type of systems are being put in place. So I think as um, this connectivity uh, equation evolves, I think there's going to be more to build into it, but definitely starting with um, cybersecurity and privacy. Yeah. And, and Katie, I, this is what your organization does, what the National Sales Co Coalition does. So it was me. Predicts the future. <laughs> Uh, so do you, do you think, um, I, I mean, I, I imagine your, your response would be that, you know, we will continue as uh, to, to Annette's point and, and, and Deborah's point, you know, technology is going to continue to evolve. More and more skills are going to be required. More investments will need to be made in, in, job, in job training um, and organizations like yours will continue to sort of facilitate that. Um, mm -hmm. But any, any thoughts? Well, so that's absolutely true. And I'd return to the idea of breaking down silos. The, um, the infrastructure bill was just passed. We're not going to be talking about that at the federal level or in Congress, except for the bickering about its implementation. Um, 
but at the but coming up in front of Congress, we have a bunch of opportunities in order to embed access to digital equity and digital skills within those reauthorizations. So we were talking about uh, the SNAP program, the Farm Bill being up for reauthorization this year means that there's an opportunity to leverage the investment that goes through farm programs to support someone's education and training that then they could use those funds to support access to digital skills. Our public workforce system is governed by the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. That's been up for reauthorization. And so I think and and could again be a really critical place to embed some of the the things that we know are, are really useful, both in enabling funds to be used to support access to devices that flexible support service funds can help someone access and connect yeah. as well as having access to the skills because it is that whole trifecta of, of a snowball when you know that the um, the programs are working together. And then the other thing I'll say to the speed of innovation happening, um, channeling again the author of the report, Amanda, she likes to say that across the pandemic, we saw 10 years worth of technological change in 10 months. And for workers who who don't are not connected to a four year degree, that means that they're then going back to try and figure out how to keep those skills and keep the job that they've had. Um, and so that really means leaning into business and, and small business in particular awareness about their needs over time. We can have surveys, we can have the data that tells us that that's critical. It's also critical with pairing together the voice of a business at a local level to really understand what are the specific skills they need. So we're, we're making these invest investments Yes, I absolutely support that we need more of them in both workforce and helping people access and reach towards digital equity. It's also about making sure that we're investing in the right places now so that we can then make the case for how important and how well these uh, investments could impact states, local areas, and people who've left been, been left behind by intentional policy decisions that we've made. Thank you. I think we have um, a couple of minutes left if... if uh, open up to, to folks in the audience for a, a couple of questions. Uh, can we go dated? Okay, dated. So, we're the bio about this adoption challenge. And I'm curious, Lady Buster Gornet, you know, Congress seems to have dedicated a lot more money for the rural truck organization. the challenge. Like the adoption challenge, she is all okay to the size of number of people. Keep they don't be off the too many that will North Carolina have other resources, will you already be resources or, or other resources that it is to make sure your physiography plan is in for a check it. Uh, what would North Tries and other states happy to go ahead and find other resources to add? Um, well, we hope there will be some flexibility with BEAD. We would like to, um, but also with digital equity funds that are coming along with that. You're right, it's not as much, but we're trying to. Um, leverage our partnerships um, across the state. There's a lot of philanthropy that's come our way that's talking to us about considering um, collaborative, a funding is collaborative. Um, and we actually want them to try to match some of what we already have. Um, my office, you know, from the ARPA funds has $50 million that we're, you know, working with. Um, it's still not as much as what was on the infrastructure, um, but we are being wise about how we invest it and how we invest in impact for programs that can be uh, replicable and that people see as something they would want to invest in. Um, and so we hope that's where philanthropy comes in. We hope that's where corporate philanthropy comes in. Um, and also that it will show the type of impact that public policymakers will want to um, build upon. Okay. And sir? I'm a resident of Dallas. So we'll Bellman, and I was just at CSET, Surgery Security, where in fact, and Troy uh, Shadow. What, one of the things that what I saw about the list, one of the things that we're looking at is the divide between the Abbott and Abbott, the rural areas, urban areas, in terms of the lack of uh, everybody goes to the digital divide. My question is should we have like a digital service score, kind of like your first academy for digital services? How do we get the U.S. private sector, right? the EWS, Salesforce to support or incentivize youth in these areas so that they can? support our trade competitiveness and national security because we have this China. But also I would argue I do a lot of work in Africa. It's also important for us to support democratic partners that leave the same Western values that we have. Because if you look at what's going on in Africa, like China and Russia are there. We're not addressing that. I don't know who is best to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, two two questions. Well I will 
provide an example uh, that I think anyone could build upon um, or replicate and actually expand it uh, to what you're defining, and that is the remote learning work group that happened in North Carolina. A lot of corporations came together to, to invest in programs to help with that, and so we had a, a state agency that kind of executed across the state, and they built these tech teams, and the tech teams were um, really younger people, and those tech teams were, the younger people know so much about technology that they, um, you know, they kind of have the wherewithal. They are teaching uh, the seniors in the community. They're even teaching some of their own teachers on how to use some of this and how to understand, um, you know, certain things, certain apps. And I think that's really gone a long way in helping people feel uh, the connectivity, um, especially, uh, you know, our senior population, those who feel isolated. And I think that they were a big part of, uh, you know, kind of strengthening that isolation or, or improving upon that. Um, and now people are looking at that and people are saying, hey, we've got to build upon this. We can expand this. This can be more. I think corporations are looking at it saying, OK, we're all back online. We're all back in person. But what's next? What do we do next? So I actually am going to take that as kind of some uh, a recommendation. Good. Don't know what the second question, but um, was that? International. International. Yeah. I'll put was in the first row. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, but if we're just debating, not going. Um, is that yes and right, what you just described, there's numerous core programs that are supported by Corporation for National Service and within our current structure. I think part of what the solution is, again, just to go back to the fact that we started with, right, 92% of jobs require some digital skills. So let's just say it all. And, um, and so what we need to embed throughout all of the ways that we help someone connect to a job and to skills is by having some of the other programs that already exist be connected to the digital needs instead of sitting within the 20 year, 15 years ago, since the last reauthorization of some of those big packages, our core networks, um, apprenticeship, helping someone at a technical or community college access these skills in a program that's not necessarily intentionally right now connected to how someone's getting digital skills. And then the one other thing I'll say from domestic and the, the connections, particularly with businesses, um, NSC, and we're doing this in large part with some of the the um, uh, person power from Comcast and other corporations, is bringing together a list of Fortune 500 companies who are invested in this idea of digital equity the way that we were talking about it. It's yeah. about the adoption. It's about the devices. It's about skills. Mm -hmm. And having, enabling those private partners to use that bully pulpit to connect to whether it's, it's a core system or an innovation that's going to work in North Carolina or in a foreign country. Thank you. And sir, we, yeah, we, we have time for one more, one more short question, please. Okay, I'll keep it quick. Um, best case scenario, we've got the workforce, we've got the American-made material, we're digging trenches, uh, to put fiber optic line. Um, you've got the Mountain West, you've got small rural communities. Um, in the best case scenario, how long will it take to grease this to throw this out each year? Two years, five years, yeah. yeah. That's a good question. No, that's a good question. I hope it'll be two years. No, but I mean, who knows? I mean, it could obviously could go as far as five years. I mean, given the workforce shortage. So I think addressing that would be a part of the solution. I would say addressing that um, and learning how to attract people who would be interested and have the skills. But um, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, the providers making it plain that there's a need and here's how you know, working with us can be, um, you know, really valuable and beneficial, not just to you, but, you know, to closing the digital divide. So um, I really can't say what the best scenario would be, um, but our hope for, I know our great grants is two years. Yeah. And some of that's already happening. Um, so, but I was just reading recently, uh, again, it goes back to digital schools and, and, and labor, because I read one of the New England states was having a hard time just getting workers to deploy to do the actual work. So this thing's all sort of, you know, it's all intertwined. Will it take two years? Well, it might take more if we don't have a, a skilled workforce to be able to dig up the ground and to, to lay the yeah. table. And the supply chain issue, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I can, I can tell you that, that, you know, Comcast, Charter Cox, and, and, and other ISPs are uh, excited um, and are, are uh, doing building out to these to these harder to reach areas as quickly as they can but but you know laying the laying the fiber connecting the fiber um uh dealing with different topography and geography 
uh, is challenging, but it is the work. These are these are high, highly skilled jobs that are yeah. that are required to make these connections. And so, uh, there there is a there is a willingness and an eagerness on the part of ISPs yeah. to connect as many households as quickly as possible. And also, the Act mandates that you have to start with the unserved communities first. That is one of the priorities of the, of the Act itself. Yeah, it's unserved and then unserved and then underserved. So, so they, so it is prioritized. Okay. So very, thank you, sir. Uh, very last, very, very last question. I would just like to ask this, um, of, of folks, uh, we covered a lot of ground today. Um, uh, briefly, we'll start with the net Deborah and then Katie, uh, what's the one message that you want our audience to leave with? Today. Oh, I'll just keep it simple. There's so many messages that I have <laughs> in my hand, but I would say partnership and listening. I mean, partnership is very key to this. We all know that. Um, but listening to not just um, listening to the constituents, listen to your consumers, and listening to the state. Adoption. You, you, you got to get people to sign up in order to make that happen. They have to be aware of it, and you need to know where they are, so you have to do the the mapping. So I think it's critical. We can't succeed without that adoption. We're going to get deployment, but we can't succeed without a gosh. Thank you. Very good. By both echoing the, the expertise that you both shared on the panel in these last comments, I would add to it to say that again, 92% of jobs, all jobs require digital skills. That means both getting the folks who are going to um, dig the trenches and lay down the fiber, as well as the folks that are going to be working at that um, nonprofit that's going to help someone train up with the basic skills they need to click on the computer and help them access their their FNS benefits. So I would yeah. say that, again, the partnership and connections are critical. And for folks who want to hear my esteemed colleague's voice in her writing in the report, instead of my uh, summary of it, you can find it on our website at nationalskillscoalition.org. Thank you. And so um, thank you all for being here today and for being patient with us. We're a couple minutes over. Uh, I think as demonstrated, uh, these are three incredible thought leaders uh, in this area. And I hope I, I can speak for the three of you in that I would imagine they'd be more than happy to serve as a resource uh, to you and your work as you go back. And so um, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us uh, if we can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.